Welcome to XYPN Radio, where your host, Alan Moore, brings you into a community of fee-only financial planners who want to profitably and successfully serve Gen X and Gen Y clients. If you're ready to get the knowledge you need from leaders in your field, learn from forward-thinking advisors, and take action on your own goals, XYPN Radio is the show for you. Here's your host. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I'm your host, Alan Moore, and I'm excited to have XYPN member Debbie Gallant, founder of Gallant Financial Planning in D.C., on the show today. Debbie has had a very unique career path, which included her reselling Thomas the Tank Engine toys on eBay and owning a massage therapy studio, before ultimately chasing her dream to own her own financial planning firm. Debbie started the CFP education in 2008 and launched her own firm in 2009, and we talked about the decision to go solo instead of taking a job, which was ultimately a no-brainer for her given her previous entrepreneurial endeavors. Debbie has been hiring as of late and now has three full-time team members, two of which are paraplanners and one admin, plus a virtual assistant. And we talked about how most of her staff just sort of showed up when she wasn't looking to hire, but she took a leap of faith and hired them because she knew they were the right fit for her firm. One really unique thing about Debbie's business is that she and her team, along with her therapy dogs, works from her home and meets with clients there as well. And we talked about the unique dynamic that presents. Debbie has truly built a business that supports the lifestyle that she wants to live, and you're not going to want to miss this interview. You can find any of the additional resources that we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 157. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to join our private group just for XYPN radio listeners. It's the community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. Again, that's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Debbie. Hey, Debbie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being on. Yeah, thank you. I am so excited. Me too. I, I love being able to talk to members who I don't know their their story. And, and I know just enough of your story that some of our team members had shared with me to, to know that I wanted to learn more. So I'm excited. Just to, to kick things off, could you give me just a bit of a high level view of your firm, sort of where you're located, uh, number of clients, number of team members, when you got started, and then we'll dig into the details. Yeah, yeah. So I am located in the uh, Washington, D.C. suburbs of Maryland and started my practice, started my journey in 2008 and really got my business off the ground in 2009 and 2010. There are, let's see, two, I've got two full-time sort of para planners who I'm brought on board in the last 18 months and I'm putting them both through the CFP program. I've had a full-time admin person for about four years and a part-time virtual assistant for five years. She just told me we just celebrated our fifth anniversary. (laughs) That's a good VA because she can keep up with things like that. (laughs) Exactly right. I love it. Yeah. So I I get nasty grams when I've dropped the ball on things. Let's see. I have a home-based business. So during the day, there are four of us working here out of my home and then my two financial therapy dogs. Got 60 clients, 60 retainer clients, actually, and generally have, you know, three, four, five project clients at any one time. And that's been pretty consistent for the last couple of years. There are about a hundred questions that I have about some of the stuff that you just mentioned. So I am so excited to dig into this. And I also love it when people are from DC because no one's from DC. It's like DC area. And then you have to say what state of DC area because it, it cracks me up. Virginia side, Maryland side. So anyway, so you said your your journey started in 2008. Is that when you got into financial planning or had, had you already been in the industry for a little while? Yeah. So actually really started my career life 1984 when I graduated from UVA with an environmental science undergraduate and then dove right into a master's degree in urban and regional planning. So got the planning part right, just the wrong wrong part. And uh, it was 1986 that I told a friend of mine when I was working at Booz Allen doing EPA work that I wanted to be a financial planner. So it took from 1986 all the way to 2008 before I started my first financial planning class. And in between there, I spent 11 years working with the federal EPA 
in their solid and hazardous waste programs doing regulatory development. And then 16 years as a massage therapist and a large eBay reseller of Thomas the Tank Engine trains. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. And then it was time to change careers again, apparently. And I started thinking about what what were some common themes that I had in all of the things that I did? And I thought, well, gosh, you know, I was healing the environment. I mean, I've been a big, you know, environmentalist since we lived in California in the early 70s. Healing people through nutrition and massage therapy. So I was like, gosh, you know, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? And I thought about life coaching. I thought about landscape architecture. I thought about building decks or doing computers. And I kept circling back to I loved financial planning. I loved doing it for myself. When I started getting bored doing massage therapy, I would be talking to my clients about their 401ks while they were on the massage table. And that was sort of the the realization that it was time to change. And that's why I, 2008, signed up for my first class online, joined NAPFA as a student affiliate, joined Financial Planning Association, and the rest is history. It's been 10 years and one month. Well, congratulations. What a journey. And it sounds like you actually have 10-year like stints. So is the financial planning stint coming to a close or is this one, this one's for the rest of your career? I think at 56 and having kind of figured out a better balance for myself, I mean, I'm doing everything I want to be doing. I'm working from home. I'm self-employed. I set my own schedule. I don't have to sit at a desk all day. In fact, I'm at my standing desk. I can have dogs in my office. I can go outside and garden when I'm bored. I've got fabulous team who I'm nurturing and growing. And why would I want to do anything else? (laughs) (laughs) It's so true. It it sounds like a dream. And I will remind listeners, this is a dream 10 years in the making. You don't get this from day one when you start your business, but it is what uh, many of us set out to build, right? Was a, a business that supports our own version of a great life. Now, real quick, before we move on, I, I have to ask about the the eBay reselling of Thomas the Tank Engines because my three and a half year old son is, he believes he is Harold the Helicopter and I mean, truly loves Thomas. So is this something you still do or still have pieces of? <laughs> oh, I Regretfully not, but actually I got into selling on eBay in, I think it was like 19... 19- 99, maybe 2000. It was just when eBay, eBay, you still had to write your own HTML to get a listing that wasn't black and white, like dot matrix printer looking. And my son, you know, was a little guy and I would go buy big sets of Thomas and break them up and sell them in pieces individually on eBay. And I found out that there were some trains that were in sets that were not, you couldn't individually purchase, but grandma would pay $30 for a train (laughs) that I could buy in a big set for $10. So anyway, no, I don't do that anymore. The market kind of crashed about actually right around the time, but 2010, I stopped selling Thomas, closed that, that part of my life. Oh, that is awesome. So, I mean, you've sort of, uh, your career has been entrepreneurial, right? I mean, because as a massage therapist, eBay reselling, I mean, now into financial planning, I guess, what what do you feel like sort of created that entrepreneurial spirit for you? You know, I, I don't know in that, you know, both of my parents come from families where, you know, people just kind of worked as teachers, nurses or whatever, though my dad has, you know, he started his own mortgage company. He was buying and, you know, buying and renting out residential houses. So I think maybe my dad sort of has that self-employed bent. A few of your uh, earlier guests have talked about being unemployable. And while I made a good employee, I did not make a happy employee. Mm, That makes sense. 
Yeah. And I think it's so important for us to know ourselves. I am on that list of unemployable. You know, I, I can't imagine a situation what it would take to, to get me to, to have a boss again. And it's just, you know, like I said, it's that freedom, it's that flexibility. And, and there's just something about not having to answer to other people that is, it's hard to let go of, especially once you've experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. So while I'm happy to answer to my clients, I, I don't want a boss. Yeah, it, it's a great point that, I mean, our clients are our boss, uh, but it's different, right? That we, we're we still accountable. You don't get to just run around, do whatever you want. You still have to run the business, but it's just a little different, which is fun. So you, you mentioned that, so you've had this interest in personal finance and then ultimately started the financial planning classes there sort of 2008. And you said you launched your business in 2009. What drove you to launch your own business versus joining another firm? Was it just the timing? Because obviously not a good year to be looking for a job in personal finance, or was there some other reason you decided to just go your own way instead of going and working for someone else? Gosh, I just, it didn't even occur to me to work for somebody else, really. (laughs) You know, I have been self-employed since 1995 when the EPA contract that I was on ended and all of us were laid off and I figured that was actually a gift because I was working full time at night with a financial, I mean, with a massage therapy practice. So I, you know, it had been, gosh, 20 years since I had doing the math wrong, but it'd been a long time since I had worked for somebody else. And I had read Nancy Langdon Jones's book. So you want to be a financial planner. And she was basically telling people how they could just go out and start their own fee-only financial planning business. And I was like, hey, that sounds good. I mean, I had been dabbling and doing taxes for friends. I had taught a tax class and a marketing class at the massage therapy school that I went to. And I just thought, I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to keep doing this, only more. I love the entrepreneurial spirit. Like I said, they, like it don't even it doesn't even cross your mind. Whereas for most people, the thought of starting a business fresh out of the gate never crosses their mind, which is fine. I mean, again, there's no right or wrong answer. Everyone has their own journey. So talk to me about the process of starting your own firm. I mean, this was pre XYPN, pre a lot of the resources that are out there today. So that process of getting started on your own, especially given uh, where the market was at at the time and, and, you know, financial planning wasn't necessarily top of mind for a lot of consumers who were, you know, potentially losing their jobs or, or you know, just lost half of their retirement savings. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as I was taking the classes and I joined NAPFA and I was reading a lot of Bob Veery's materials And I started reading also Bert Whitehead, you know, with what's now the Alliance for Comprehensive Planners. I read Cheryl Garrett's book. And so I felt like I had some ideas on what to do. One of the smartest things I did was in 2009, Napa had a conference in D.C. And I got on the phone and I started calling members, NAPA members in the DC area to see if there's anybody that I could meet at the conference. And the study group leader at the time, Barry Korb, met with me at the conference and took me under his wing and convinced me to come to the study group. And I had been intimidated by that thinking, oh, there's all these people who are really you know, they know what they're doing and I'm just starting out. It couldn't have been a warmer, more welcoming group of people who shared everything they knew about starting and running a business with me. That was my experience with NAPFA as well. So it would have been really around the time you were joining. So 2009, 2010, I think was my first NAPFA conference. And I was just amazed at how giving the people were, you know, because in all business, but especially in financial services, I mean, we're sort of known for being this cutthroat industry that, you know, is only out for ourselves and greedy and all these things. Uh, The last thing you think of is that a group of financial advisors, especially in a city together, are going to get together and talk about how to better run their businesses because they, you know, but they're competitors. Why would they do that? But but they do. And that's what I loved about the culture of NAPFA and something that's been very important to us at XY Planning Network is maintaining that culture of collaboration because the the, the ocean is so big. Uh, you know, we're each just a small drop of water in that ocean. 
and we can do so much to help each other. Yeah, I mean, I I really believe everyone in the study group here in DC had the view that we were just making the lar- the pie larger, that there was just enough business for everybody. So, you know, that was really probably the single best thing I had done. What I regret not doing at this time was either joining the Garrett Network or actually probably what was, you know, the Alliance for Cambridge Advisors, which is now the Alliance, you know, for Comprehensive Planners. I really regret not having joined ACP. And of course, XY Planning Network wasn't around at that point. I would have saved tens of thousands of dollars for not recreating the wheel and, you know, wasting time doing things that someone else could have just said, here, here's a template. (laughs) Here's a place to get started. And yeah, I I feel like whether you join Garrett or ACP or XY Planning Network, ultimately it's about finding your tribe and finding the people that that best align with your philosophy and how you want to operate. But uh, yeah, you don't have any questions. There's nothing facing you that some other advisor in any of those networks hasn't already dealt with. You know, and so going and learning from them can save you three, six, 12 months of heartache and, and a lot of money, like you said, and take, you know, taking a lot of missteps that could be avoided when, you know, there's others that are willing to say like, hey, I did it that way. And and here's my advice, uh, given what I've learned. And, you know, if, if you're willing to heed that advice, it can be amazing, you know, how far that pushes your company forward. Yeah, well, that was the other problem was heeding advice. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about how I operate in the world. And I was always the person who, you know, whether it was undergraduate or grad school or massage school or whatever, didn't ask questions. And so I look at all the resources that are were out there and are out there now even more so. And I still don't always ask questions. I don't ask for help. I don't take advantage of the resources. And um, even working with coaches, I haven't fully, I I was going to say exploited, but just don't, don't use the resources as well. And so when I joined XYPN in January of this year, you know, I made a commitment to myself that this was an investment that was going to pay off if I actually put the time in to access everything. Absolutely. No, it's a great point that, that you get out of it what you what you take out of it. And ultimately, you know, can't, you know, force people to use the resources or, or you know, come into the forums and ask questions. But when folks do make that commitment to come in and do that, uh, they certainly get a lot more out of membership than folks that don't. So how did you get your first round of clients? You know, because I can see it from both sides, but, you know, looking at this as the devil's advocate, when you were first starting your firm, you've never worked as a financial planner. You know, again, it's 2009. Why am I going to hire you to be my advisor? I mean, how did you, how did you get that first round of clients to sort of build the foundation for your business? Yeah. Yeah. So here I was, right. Um, Totally cold, out of the box, I could do taxes and I knew how to use Quicken and didn't know, thought I knew about investing, hit the section of the CFP training on bonds, realized I didn't even know what a bond was. And my little apple cart tipped over at that point. I actually stopped studying for about six months and just read a bunch of books so that I could understand what was going on. So you know, luckily my first clients were my friends and family. Mostly my my husband's mother was my first client. Two of my sisters-in-law, luckily my husband has a big family up here in the DC area. Now five of my former massage clients are clients of my financial planning business. And so I just started out very slowly. It took me four years to get my three uh, 6,000 hours for the CFP. So I did not actually, even though I passed the exam in 2010, I didn't have my hours until 2012 in order to become a CFP. Okay. Yeah. So four years to, to get the hours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm married. I, I had a kindergartner at the time that I, you know, started. I was still trying to see my massage clients at the same time. 
finally gave that up in 2010. I realized I, I couldn't couldn't wear that many hats. Yeah, I, I love what you, that, that some of your massage therapy clients became your financial planning clients because what a great story for them about how their massage therapist became their financial planner. But it sounds to me like your, your I guess, theory of planning and sort of your philosophy of financial planning uh, integrates so tightly with the work that you did as a massage therapist. Because, you know, it sounds like you didn't view massage therapy as just, you know, just helping someone relax a little bit, that it was actually, you know, helping them heal. And, you know, I guess in personal finance, we help people, we can, if we choose to work with those clients, we can help them heal financially. Like, is there a, a real intersection there for you? Yeah, there really was because people would come and I would hear their stories, you know, so it wasn't just, oh, I hurt my, you know, leg in a bike accident or I'm stressed out at work and and my neck is killing me. You know, I really got to know the people and and, and just sort of the, the emotional parts of their lives. And they developed a sense of real trust for me. They knew I cared about them, that I was going to be trying to help them. And so when I started telling people I was transitioning my business, and of course, I'd already been talking to them about the fact, you know, my favorite topic, which was financial planning or taxes or whatever, they, you know, they trust me. And so I have the same caring Relate, you know, relationship with with all of my clients that I had with folks when they were massage therapy clients. You know, it, in my office, you know, I, as I, I made the joke about the financial therapy dogs, but they actually they're the little Karen Terriers are down here. I've got a round table. I have a very comfortable office, and we have conversations. I don't have meetings. I have conversations. Talk to me about the dogs, because I know there's a lot of research showing the value of animals, therapy animals, whether it be cats in hospitals or, you know, or, or having therapy dogs during finals week in college. And I know for folks that have never really experienced that or don't experience anxiety, they may not fully appreciate the value that they bring. So are the dogs in the meeting? Do they, I guess they're pretty small. So do they hop up in, in the laps of clients or do they sort of stay away? I guess, how do, how do you leverage them in the meeting to make the meeting more effective? You know, the, the, you know, the dogs being dogs are going to be at the front door when the clients or, or prospective clients come. I always let people know, hey, I've got dogs. If this is a problem, you know, they won't be here. I probably have had, you know, maybe 2% of any, you know, have, have said, no, no, thank you. I don't like dogs or whatever. Most people are like, oh, yeah, I love dogs. And so the dogs are just down here and it's sort of an icebreaker. Oh, what's your dog's name? Where'd you get him? Oh, he's a rescue dog. Oh, that's so nice. I, you know, and it's, it's a way of getting to know each other without it being about, tell me about your net worth and all the mistakes you made investing in your portfolio. <laughs> uh, but that's such a great way to get to know someone is talk about all their failures first off. <laughs> yeah, I, like I said, I, I love it. I, I don't think I've ever seen a uh, financial advisor with animals there. But like I said, I, I know the power of of having animals that, you know, and we're not talking about animals that are like jumping around and barking in the meeting, right? Like these are dogs that, that are, well, I guess, are they certified or are these, you know, are you, are you literally joking by calling them therapy or are they certified? It is a joke, but I do tell people that, yeah, as a joke that, that they're financial therapy dogs. They're both, they're older dogs, they're seniors, they are small, they've got short little legs, and so they don't jump, they, they're not barkers, and most of the time they're just sleeping in my office. So again, they're just sort of there. So, yeah. And, you know, I, I imagine some people self-select themselves out of working with me because I have dogs or maybe because I work out of my home, which just leaves more people who think that's really cool to be available to work with me. I love that attitude that, you know, and I totally agree And that there are things like that, that, you know, we talk about having a niche and sometimes we get a, you know, get, we harp a lot on, have, you know, it's a profession or psychometric or something that, that identifies someone. But like, even just as simple as like, just enjoys the presence of your dogs 
can be it's it doesn't have to be a, a qualifier, but it's a nice one where you know it's more comfortable when they get along and and get along with you and you know everyone's seeing eye to eye. But you know, I'd be curious if if you can remember in your business when you begin to fe- feel that way, or, or maybe you always felt that way. I, I know for me, it was like first starting out, it was you work with everyone who will work with you, and and there co- comes a day where suddenly you realize like. I don't have to work with everyone and I can tell you no, or I can not be sad that you told me no, because it really wasn't a good fit. You know, I think Alan, that because I came from running another business, the massage therapy business, which is so incredibly personal, I already had realized that there were certain clients that I did not want to work with, whether it could be an ookie factor or we just didn't click. And that made it easier for me to not try to run after every single person who breathed, though there was still some of that anyway. <laughs> gotta gotta pay the bills. Do you mind if I ask you, so you said you are married and so there may have been another income there. Did, did you feel, did you have the pressure of needing to bring in income from day you're not from day one, but to to get the business up and running to a certain level of income, were y'all dependent on your income or, or were you able to, you know, did you benefit from being able to sort of relax and not have to press as hard? Yeah, yeah. So in fact, in 2003, I had first started to take the CFP classes. And that is actually when my son was in kindergarten and I had recently gotten divorced. And so I was a single mom and I realized I couldn't have done it in 2003. And I got remarried in 2007. And one of the things that my new husband and I talked about was, hey, I've actually always wanted to do this. It's, so I, I talked to him about my business plan when we were you know, dating actually in 06. And I told him I wanted to become a financial planner. And so you know, mid 08, he's like, you know, Debbie, why don't you just do it? And so, you know, I was able to you know, spend probably five years not being particularly profitable. Yeah. And and I asked that question, not out of judgment. I I, I hope listeners know that it does not make the path, the path easier. It just makes it different, you know, because I've heard the argument too, that, you know, I've actually had some folks that, you know, had spouses that had income say, I wish I didn't have that because I probably would have, I would have pushed harder if I'd known that. Others say like, hey, it was a nice benefit and, you know, still still cranked on it and built the business. And, and, you know, and others may say that, you know, hey, it gave me the opportunity to build the right business instead of being so desperate for income that I did work with all those clients that I shouldn't have worked with, which slowed me down. So, you know, everyone has a has their own story. But I was just curious, sort of the pressures you felt as you were getting started, you know, with with your own practice. Yeah. yeah. In fact, Alan, I probably should have had more pressures because, you know, I did. I did throw a lot of money at training and maybe that's some of Carl Richards, you know, the imposter syndrome. But by the time I did pass the CFP and had my 6,000 hours, I also had my CHFC and, and that's through the American College. And then I also had gone through both George Kinder's uh, registered life planning program, which was phenomenal. And also Carol Anderson and Amy Mullins, their money quotient program. And so I invested a lot of money in learning the skills that I wanted to have for my clients. I mean, and how do you feel like that has improved your your ability to, to be a great financial advisor? You know, I think it's the communication skills that uh, both of those programs really emphasized. And, you know, my husband, who obviously, you know, he knew me before I started those programs, told me that it really changed how I related to him and how I communicated with him. So I got sort of the double blessing of communicating better with my clients and being a better listener and also being a better listener and communicator in my own marriage and other relationships. So I have never personally been through Money Quotient, but uh, we used a lot of the tools at the first firm that I worked at, and I know Amy Mullen pretty well. So for folks that are interested in 
taking the next step towards learning how to be a better communicator, a better listener, the the art of financial planning, check out Money Quotient. It's moneyquotient.org. They're organized as a nonprofit and they have some really great resources and training and and stuff, ongoing, ongoing tools and that sort of thing as well. And I know Amy's really starting to grind away at some cool new stuff. So check them out and be on the lookout for for new stuff that they're working on because they're definitely one of the best organizations that that does the communication and training, but also understands financial planning. So fast forwarding a little bit. So you're, so the full-time virtual assistant, that was your first hire that you made? Yeah. Yeah. I had hired Jennifer Goldman of my virtual COO to help me make some decisions about software. And also did I want to start managing money or just advise on money at Vanguard, which I had been doing at the time. And so Jennifer really worked with me over about six months to kind of transition from, you know, more of a a lifestyle hobbyist type to more of a business. And one of the things she did was help me get onto the TD platform when I only had $2 million under management. Yeah. And she also found the virtual assistant, Kim Creaky, that I use. And yeah, and so that was great because she was able to tell me she knew what I needed before I did. Beauty of consultants that, that really know the space. Again, I've never worked with Jennifer directly, but I've, I've only heard great things. So is that a recommendation you'd make for advisors that are sort of hitting that, I, I guess, that inflection point of, you know, what direction do I want to take this business? Yeah, it can be an inflection point, but it also can just be a decision point. A few months ago, I used her service where for I think it's 449, you can schedule a 45 minute call with her right on her website. And she just does a Zoom consultation with you and you just tell her what's going on, you know, what questions you have, and she can just answer them. And I know what people are thinking. Four forty nine for forty five minutes. How could how could it possibly be worth it? I assume this is something you would highly recommend. Oh yeah, oh yeah. She she helped me avoid making some expensive missteps on some software I was thinking about, and sent me in the right direction. It's that old adage of you know the the you know the factory shuts down because a piece of machinery breaks. They can't find anybody to fix it. You know, they finally find the guy, the one guy that can, the old guy comes in, bangs it with a wrench, starts working again. He charges, sends him an invoice for $10,000. He said, $10,000, it took you five seconds. Go, yeah, but it took me a lifetime to, to learn how to do this. And so, yeah, folks like Jennifer, consultants in general, we tend to think about the number of hours that we spend with them without recognizing the number of hours they are spending honing their craft and, and, you know, for the ability that that 45 minutes is hyper productive, much like financial advisors and how much value can we provide our clients in 45 minutes. So, so that's great to know. Yeah. Like I said, Jennifer is, uh, is fantastic and I've only heard great things. So whenever you brought on the virtual assistant, I know that is the first hire. Some folks are, are torn between paraplanner and VA. One, I guess, why did you decide VA over a paraplanner? And then two, sort of how did how did how do you work with her and how has that evolved over time and sort of what what's what have you learned in terms of working with a virtual assistant? Yeah, so I hired Kim because Jennifer was able to get me onto the TD platform and that felt so incredibly overwhelming, you know, to repaper everything from Vanguard over to TD. I just didn't want to deal with it. And I was moving everybody. I think that I had 15 clients by then. So we moved a bunch of accounts over and I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. And Kim does this all day. And she works with a number of other advisors and, and does a lot of work on the TD platform, though she also works on other platforms. And so, you know, when TD calls me now, I don't even pick up the phone. I know they're going to turn around and call Kim and Kim's going to take care of it. And I don't have to think about it. And maybe I should be, you know, more proactive or whatever, but you know what? She's good at what she does and I don't have to be. I have in my CRM, I'm still on Grendel. Love those guys looking for a new soft, new CRM, but I, she's 
gets tasks from me. So, you know, because there's me, my three full-time people here in my home office, and then Kim's in Colorado. So there are five of us and I've got workflows and I just activate whatever workflow or task I have for her to do. And so she communicates back and forth through the CRM. And if it's part of a larger workflow and her task gets gets activated, she gets an email saying, you're, you're it. When she's done with that or has something to say to me or my one of my parent planners or my admin person, then they get that communication through, you know, the CRM as well. That's awesome. Yeah. And I hear great things, but everyone, some folks struggle with that, you know, sort of kicking off that relationship. But it sounds like you really did hire her because she had an area of expertise. It wasn't like you were training her how to fill out TD forms. She she brought that expertise in and was able to ramp up pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have to train her on anything, which is good because at that point, I didn't know enough to train anybody else. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The beauty of filling out forms the first time, you will screw it up. But you also mentioned that you have a full-time admin. So you have the virtual assistant and the admin. So how did they split duties or did they do a lot of the same stuff at this point? Yeah. So I hired my admin person maybe about three and a half years ago. I'm thinking her mom is a client and I just was talking about her daughter who was taking accounting classes at the local you know, community college. And I was thinking, I'm trying to use QuickBooks and really doing a bad job of it. I have many fine qualities. Reading directions is not one of them. (laughs) And I didn't want to deal with it. So I hired her for a small project. And then I thought, well, hey, she could do my scanning for me. And because I have a paperless office. And then I'm like, oh, she can file what little paper I do have. And I just kept throwing work at her. And so now she handles, you know, basically anything that's not client facing that doesn't relate to TD Ameritrade. And she's busy all day. She works so hard. And so I've done, I also do hand off some work, like she might enter the initial client information into our CRM and then send it over to Money Guide Pro. And now we've just started using eMoney. So she can do some basic things that don't require a deep understanding of financial planning. Yeah, no, that that makes perfect sense. And then you hired two full-time pair planners. So did you hire them at the same time or were they spaced out a little bit? Yeah, so about a year and a half ago... A a woman who actually had been sort of a very part-time intern with another friend of mine uh, from the D.C. Metro study group for NAPFA called me and said, hey, do you have any work? Because she wanted – her kids had gotten older. She wanted to do more financial planning, and the person she was working with didn't have as much work. So I wasn't looking for anybody, but I thought, sure, why not? I mean, I knew her from – you know for you know, meetings and whatnot. So I started trying to hand off, you know, simple things to her. You know, I think she was working like eight hours a week. And then the more I got to know her and I realized that she actually had a master's degree in economics and studied at the London School of Economics and had done most of her PhD for retirement planning, but it happened to be in Russia. And I realized I had a gold mine. And so I started handing her real work, which was something my friend hadn't done. And the next thing I know, I'm paying for her to study for the CFP exam. She's working full time. She just got back from the XYPN residency program. She said she saw you, Alan, at PF Chang's, by the way. She did. Yep. Yep. And that's how... I just sort of, it just happened. Yeah. So I I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's how I had Irina starting. And once she gets her CFP, I'm going to, you know, she won't really be a paraplanet anymore. She will be doing a lot of the investment advice support for me. You know, I think it's important for from both the the hiring as well as being the the prospective employee. So if you are, you know, if you're a student or you're looking at getting uh, your first job in financial planning, recognize that most advisory firms, after they've been in business 
five years, we'll say, just, just for a rule of thumb, can hire someone. They may not have found the right person. They may not have posted a job. They may not have made a decision to. But if they came across the perfect candidate, they could financially hire them. And so, you know, not all jobs, actually, the majority of jobs are never posted online. So it does require, you know, be proactive, go take an internship, even if it's so far beneath you to take an internship and and just get your foot in the door. Because guess what? That planner that you're working for, if you prove yourself, even if they can't hire you, they know a hundred other planners and a bunch of them in the local area that might be able to hire you and make that introduction. So be a little proactive. I, I think that's the the part of that story that that I, I think is important. But also from the hiring perspective is sometimes these things do happen. There's no perfect way to hire. You know, if you're hiring a bunch of people, you have to have a pretty clear process in place. But sometimes the right people fall in your lap and don't don't miss the opportunity to have the right person in the bus, even if they're on or, you know, as long as they're on the bus, if they're in the wrong seat, that's OK. You can get them in the right seat over time, but just get them on the bus because you don't want to let those people go. Yeah. Yeah. And so I found a place on the bus for Irina that I didn't know. I, I didn't know I needed her. And actually six months after she contacted me, a young woman who was in her last, no, she actually, she was third years, her third year at school, econ major was looking for an internship. And so she worked with me last summer And again, I started her out with filing and scanning, and she did anything I threw at her and came back and asked for more. And so when she came back from study abroad, I I gave her a a part-time job last December. She graduated from college two weeks ago, and I hired her full-time, and she started her CFP program a week later. Wow. So you truly, you never post jobs. I'm not going to ask you how you source candidates here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I think I'm full right now, but I think there are a lot of people who don't know they need somebody or it's just too hard to think about hiring. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm just really lucky that both of these women are just fabulous and I'm so excited to have them, you know, going through the program. And, you know, as I start thinking about my succession plan, part of my thinking is, do I become an S Corp and make them partners? Yeah. What are you thinking there? Recognizing they're probably going to listen to this podcast. So these no promises to all of the team members, but what are you thinking there? It, are you thinking that it will just, you know, sort of a earn out and, and start selling shares or do you see it, you know, structured differently? Yeah. You know, I'm still working on that, Alan, but I've been started working with FP transitions about a year and a half ago, mostly for a contingency plan for my business, you know, the proverbial get hit by a bus kind of thing. And, you know, through that process, I started thinking more about, you know, the fact is now that I have a business valuation, I'm like, oh, there's a value to my business. You know, that was like this novel concept. So realizing that, you know, who do I have G2s, you know, the second generation? And um, because Irina is a good 10 years younger than I am and Courtney, gosh, 25 years younger than I am. And they would be perfect, you know, for, you know, a succession plan if that's the direction I, I would go in. And yeah, it might be earn out or, or buy in. I don't know. But, and I've let them know that this is, that I'm kind of still thinking about this. So even though I have a contingency plan, I don't have a succession plan yet. And it can be hard, you know, I mean, just like with our clients facing down estate planning, we start talking about mortality and, and, you know, and uh, thinking about death, you know, it's a tough topic. And I'm glad to hear that that this is something you're starting to think about just because it is something I think for most solo advisors or, or, you know, as they bring on an employer too, it's just not top of mind. But, you know, I think our clients think about it. You know, I, I used to get a lot of questions when I was a solo advisor. What happens you know, if, if something happens to you, what happens to my accounts, what happens to my financial plan that we built together? So it's nice that you can say, well, we, we do have a plan in place and, and here's what that plan is. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people don't. And I you know there are older advisors, you know, in the D.C. area who I know don't have a succession plan 
and they know they need one and it's just too hard for them to think about it. Yeah. Isn't it funny that it's sort of the the barber with the worst haircut sometimes? <laughs> so the cobbler's child with no shoes, but it is important. And, you know, most of us or most financial advisors don't have their own financial plan or their own financial planner, much less, you know, starting to think about succession planning. And it all ties in together because, you know, your family deserves to get some value out of the business that you've built as well. Like you said, it has a number now. It, it has value and, you know, your family can benefit from the value in that if it's structured properly. If not, all those clients just sort of disappear and the, the company doesn't have any value. Yeah. And I saw that when I shut down my massage therapy practice, it, I, I didn't do it in a way that I monetized any value. Instead, I just referred my clients to other massage therapists. And, you know, so one by one, my clients went off to work with my friends. And I, you know, I was like, could I have sold that? Probably something, you know, there was, there was some value there. And I, so I realized that I, I don't want that to happen for my clients. And of course the SEC doesn't want it to happen to our clients either. <laughs> true. Very, very true. You, you mentioned that you have about 60 ongoing clients now and, and you're working with a, quite a few project clients. So where are these clients coming from? How are they finding you at this point? Being a bit on the introverted spectrum, I, I do all of my marketing is, you know, on the web, so, you know, I'm on the typical suspects of, you know, feeling network, NAPA, XYPN, finding advisor, you know, so I've, and I work on my website. So, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, they Googled me, right? You know, they Googled financial advisor or whatever. But also, I used to be the study group leader for uh, the D.C. Metro chapter of NAPFA, you know, after um, Barry Corb brought me under, you know, sort of his, you know, I don't know, wing or whatever. He then cleverly realized he could finally get rid of the position by asking me to do it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that was very smart of him. He, he plays long game. And so I get clients from other firms that have minimums and I don't have minimums. And so I would say at least 25% of my business comes from other local advisors who have said, why don't you call Debbie? Yeah. I, and I think that's such an awesome sales technique that most people don't use. And that is like, just go talk to other financial advisors. Just the fact, you know, and, and as much as I beat the the niche drum, not having minimums and, and being able to work with clients that don't necessarily have a million dollars or more is, it, it makes you unique still. You know, I mean, obviously that's changing uh, as more and more advisors are adopting new service models, but it's still pretty unique in the marketplace. And, you know, most advisors are, want someone to take care of people that are, that are looking for a financial advisor. They just can't afford to if, you know, if, if they typically work with higher net worth clients. Yeah, well, you know, it also helps, you know, I don't charge by AUM. I charge a flat fee retainer based on, you know, the complexity factor. I know you had talked to PJ a few months ago about this. And, you know, one of the things I like about the Alliance of Comprehensive Planners is that they really did help me think about how do I charge in a way that is understandable to me and my client. But I do have a minimum fee. If someone wants to come in and get a financial fitness review, I will do that in one working session. It takes me 10 to 12 hours plus the support from my staff, and I'll charge $3,500 for that. And that is the least amount of money someone can pay to work with me. So, yeah. So when you say you don't have asset minimums, I mean, you're, you're not charge You're not just meeting with people for an hour and charge them a hundred bucks. I mean, $3,500, that's a pretty good, you know, payment for, for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a three hour working meeting and they're getting their, their questions answered. They're getting, a, they're getting an investment, you know, asset allocation. We're doing tax planning. I might throw in a social security analyzer report, you know, money guide pro report or whatever. So they get a lot out of that time and then we can wave goodbye or they can add on, you know, if they want more time, they can add on, you know, one or two more meetings at $2,000 a meeting each. 
And if they want to keep going, then I will go on a, I'll do a 12 month retainer with a monthly fee and they can pay me monthly. Okay. So, so it's $3,500 for the first meeting. The second meeting, how uh, you said is $2,000. How long is that meeting? Is that another three hour working meeting? Three hours. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, emails back and forth. So it's, it's a collaborative and interactive process to, you know, make sure that I'm really understanding what the client is trying to get at. And so I'm not, I'm not telling them, Hey, yeah, I charge, you know, $1,100 an hour because that's not, you know, obviously I'm doing a lot of behind the scenes analysis. Yeah. So talk to me about the collaborative process. So what, I guess, how, how is your process different from your, I guess, maybe understanding of how advi- other advisors do their financial planning process? Cause that's, you know, a pretty extensive meeting, but it sounds like you're doing a lot of the plan development with the client. Yeah. So I'm going to hit upon every area of the CFP training. So I'm going to be looking at their liability insurance and their life insurance and nagging them to get long-term care insurance. I'm going to check their employee benefits to make sure they've got enough long-term disability through work. I'm going to be looking at how is their 401k invested? What are their options? You know, what is, you know, are they doing IRAs? I'm going to review their tax return. I'm going to be, you know, looking, do they have an estate plan? So they're going to get the nudging, nagging, pleading, and begging to get an estate plan done. I'm going to look at, are they, if they have kids, do they have a college fund, you know, plan? Is it through the state? Are they getting the tax deduction? So it's a full financial plan, you you know, then I've, you know, once I get all the information, I've got everything about them in my head. But then, of course, going back to the listening skills that hopefully I learned pretty well from both the Kinder program and then Money Quotient, what what is a client trying to get out of this? And sometimes it's not my agenda, obviously. And, you know, maybe it's just should they pay their mortgage off? Can they retire can they do this? Or they they have no clue. They just know they're supposed to go talk to somebody. But, you know, because I'm, I'm going to still keep Money Guide Pro, even as I am moving to eMoney, I like the goals that Money Guide Pro has because we can start talking about, you know, longevity and health and expectations of retirement. And what are the things that they really want to be doing? And as you know, sometimes that's the first time that each of the partners has heard the other say they want to do something. And so then we got to kind of talk more around that. I like to layer in healthcare costs and and just kind of a learning opportunity for them on how expensive it is in this country to get old. So you know, I'll sit and if it's just one client, if you generally, you know, I might sit in front of my computer with them and we'll go through Money Guide Pro together or I'll pull out my Surface Pro and do the screencast onto a larger screen. And, and again, we'll be building their plan, you know, during the conversation together and doing different iterations well, no, I don't really care about that beach house. What's really more important is this. I'm like, okay, well, let's model that. Well, what if I retire earlier? What, what does that look like? And so that's kind of fun. Yeah, that I used to love those. I, I called it a real-time planning session. It wasn't for my ongoing retainer clients. I did it more on a project basis. But I love those meetings because it's amazing what you can get done in an hour or two hours and helping clients see the process and see the trade-offs. We don't think in terms of trade-offs naturally. I don't feel like we don't think like, oh, I want to be able to retire early. I'm going to stop working early. You know, so how much do I need to give up in income or, or, you know, how much more should I be saving? It's really, we just think like, Oh, I'm just going to retire early. So it's really cool to show clients like the cause and effect of different decisions and help them then prioritize. Cause you know, when you first start out, everything's important, you know, after that it's, you know, helping to prioritize what's actually important. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they don't necessarily know. In fact, one of the analogies I use with prospective clients is I tell them, look, you're bringing a jigsaw puzzle box into my office and the picture 
on the box has gotten ripped or torn or, or it's not fully fleshed out. And I said, we're going to put all the pieces on the table and together we're going to first figure out what was that picture supposed to look like. And then we're going to go look for the quarter pieces and the edge pieces. And I'm going to help you put this together, but this is your puzzle. Yeah, it's fair that, you know, we like, I, I've used the puzzle analogy myself of we're, you know, just figuring out what's on the front of the box, but people don't know what the vision is on the front of the box. Like we know culturally what we've been told retirement's supposed to be, you know, retire early means before 65 and we're going to get a beach house and sit in Adirondack chairs and play golf. But like how many of us, you know, really want to do that? To me, that sounds like so boring. <laughs> so there has to be more to it than that. And, but everyone's version is going to be different. Yeah. And that's where the life planning skills come in and George's three questions and some of the fabulous tools that Amy and Carol put together to help people vision because they don't know how to do that. No, it, it's such a great point. So what are you working on sort of over the next 18 to 24 months? Obviously, you have a couple new team members that you're going to be bringing along, one very new team member. But I, I guess what what big projects or big initiatives do you have planned over the coming over the coming year or two? Yeah, so I do want to keep working on my succession plan. I, I want to, we're redoing the website. I'm trying to evaluate additional software that I might want to be using because I want to up my game on investment analysis. So you know, we're looking at, you know, do we go to Orion? Do we do risk alize? Do I bring, you know, use quanti? What integrates with what? So sometimes that could be sort of down the rabbit hole of playing with the investment, you know, with the the, uh, the tools and whatnot. The other piece, though, is, you know, both training my staff and kind of mentoring them a lot has been fun. Like yesterday, I had a meeting with both of them because, unfortunately, one of my clients is now in hospice, and so now we're looking at the will. And so I'm kind of teaching them what does it – how do you read a will with your specific client in mind – you know, and and what should we be doing there? The thing for myself, I want to take another class and I can't decide what program to do. In fact, when Michael Kitsis was speaking, we we have a, we've been, we ask him uh, for every winter social to be our speaker here in DC. And my question to him was, you know, what, what's the next program I should take? Is it the, you know, RICP or should I do this program or that program? And while he beautifully described all of the programs, he did not give me an answer. <laughs> He's like a professor like that. His typical response is, well, who's your niche client? And then let's figure out, you know, what your client needs from you. But yeah, there there are a lot of programs and you've been through, you know, if I rattled off my top couple, you've already been through them. So now it's really starting to, f- you know, focus and trying to figure out what's the, the one that's going to move your business forward. And actually, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe the class is actually more on running the business or marketing or building a team culture or something like that. It, maybe it's beyond just, you know, how to be a better financial advisor. You know, I think that could be part of the problem is that I keep thinking I don't know enough and I'm so aware of what I don't know. But when I talk to my clients, of course, they have no idea if I do or don't know something. And I probably do know everything that I need to know. I oh, also I'm working with a coach. This is my third or fourth coach, if you want to be counting, Tracy Beckus. And oh yes, you have just worked with all of the industry, just standout rock stars. Like truly, you have you have the list. Oh, <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. And Jacobson, uh, Diane McPhee, Jennifer Goldman, and now Tracy, and and. All of them have different gifts, and I want all of those gifts. And Tracy and I started working together in March, and wow, I mean, it's this has been pretty amazing. I'm working on client engagement standards, one-page business plan, a bunch of other stuff, and really that should keep me busy, and maybe I should stop chasing after the ne- next designation. 
Well, and I would say that if you're if you feel like you're struggling with the imposter syndrome, there's no better person than Tracy to to help you get past that because she's as much of a therapist as a coach, which is which is awesome. I, I've yeah, I've always been impressed with the work that she does. Yeah, yeah, she just helped me avoid a mistake of I was going to buy the practice of an advisor here locally who is get is is you know, he has an illness that, you know, at some point he's not going to be able to work with his clients, but he's not ready to let go. And I was spending a lot of time and energy trying to figure out how to make this work and how to buy his business. And she's like, run away. (laughs) She's seen it before. Right. right. It's not her first rodeo. (laughs) That's awesome. We're going to be coming up here to the end of our time here in a second, but I do want to circle back on one thing because I I think it's something that listeners will ask us if I don't address. And that is you do work out of your home, which a lot of advisors do, but you both meet with clients in your home and have uh, your employees coming to your home. Can you talk about that dynamic and the decision there? And if you've if that's something you recommend for other advisors? Yeah. So, you know, it really depends on, you know, the family dynamic and the the house situation and whatnot. You know, my son's now in college, so it's just me and my husband and the two dogs. My husband's gone early in the morning and, you know, my staff just come, they, they let themselves in. They are like early morning people. They are here before I get out of bed, I'm embarrassed to say. (laughs) I just, I cannot imagine that, that it's such an interesting dynamic. Yeah. But you know, it's, there's, you know, so they're, they kind of come in the front door and go right down the stairs and they're working away when I come downstairs, you know, a couple hours later, but because I have a ranch, a, a, a one level ranch is where my living space is. And then the downstairs basement area, but it's all open with floor to ceiling windows for most of the downstairs. And I've got two closed offices and then an open area. It's very, it feels separate from the rest of the house. And, and so I've been able to differentiate that both for the staff and my clients when they come in that we're not meeting at my dining room table. Yeah. So it sounds like your house is the perfect layout for that to work. Uh, I've heard of advisors that meet, you know, uh, at the dining room table. I'm not sure I've heard of anyone that that has folks coming to their home as well as clients coming to their home. So it's, but you know, what a great way to save money. Office space for now four people. It starts to add up. You know, even if you're going into a co working space or a shared office space environment, you know, it does it does cost money. Yeah, I feel like I do save money. I mean, we had to do some enhancements to the house when we bought it two years ago with clients in mind, things that I might not have done. Like we had to fix the sidewalk. I have to make sure the stairs are safe, but we had to add extra outdoor lighting. But those are a drop in the bucket compared to paying for a Regis or a WeWork or, you know, full-time office space. Yeah, absolutely. So, Debbie, as we're coming to a close, I'll ask you the final question. And you told me before the show that you had been listening to a few episodes uh, to get ready. So, you know the question by now. And that is, you know, if there's one thing that you've learned over the last, you know, 10 years of, of running your business that, and one piece of advice you wish you could go back and give your younger self, what do you think that piece of advice would be? Yeah, I mentioned it earlier and I'll say it again. And that is to use the resources and experience of a group like, you know, XYPN, for example, which is why I became a member, to get started more efficiently to jumpstart. I wish I had done that with, you know, 10 years ago. And I didn't, and but here I am. And the second piece is, you know, for me, I let my own money issues keep me from setting appropriate fees. And the groups that I've joined have really helped me get brave and set better fees. You know, I really, I I think about the money that I let go down, not down the drain, but I I just needed to have gotten out from my own self and charge better, higher. Yeah. Yeah. Setting your fees too low in the beginning is probably the most common misstep. And I get it. It's a confidence thing. There are a lot of reasons for it, but 
it's great to hear that you've, you know, the, those communities that you've been able to join and be a part of have helped you get that confidence because you've certainly, you certainly have the skill set. You certainly have the, you know, the ability to charge. It's just being willing to. Well, Debbie, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and and share your career path, which has been varied, but all connected in, in a really cool way. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Alan. Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYP and radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes with myself and Kitsis, and to finally find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You're not alone and you're not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the Cutting Edge Financial Planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP or text XYPN Radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients.